In this video, I want to continue looking at aspects of Ibn Taymiyyah's thought, uh, particularly in reference to Kalam theology, his criticisms of it. I'm going to be drawing on this excellent book, Ibn Taymiyyah, by Professor John Hoover. He's a professor of Islamic studies at Nottingham University here in the UK. And on page uh, 108, he writes the following. And what I like about this book by John Hoover, he brings in nuance and he brings a, an expert eye. He's not a Muslim himself, but he brings an expert analysis of Ibn Taymiyyah's thought. And he tends to debunk some of the oft-repeated myths about Ibn Taymiyyah as well. And uh, I'll, I'll mention a few of those as we go through. So on a section entitled Kalam uh, Theology, uh, the author writes... The term Kalam theology takes its name from the Arabic word Kalam, meaning speech. It's basically the Arabic equivalent of the word theology. It came to denote the rationalist theology of the Mutazilites, Asheris and others. Among Kalam theologians, Ibn Taymiyyah's chief nemesis, in other words his principal opponent, is the Ashari Fakha al-Din al-Razi. He died in 2010. Al-Razi's works contain diverse and sometimes contradictory views, but it was the kind of theology found in his book Compendium that enjoyed prominence in the early Mamluk Empire. Following the typical pattern of Kalam works, Al-Razi's Compendium seeks to ground fundamental theological doctrines in reason apart from revelation. This, by the way, is a, a really important point, I think. Al-Razi first sets out his philosophical presuppositions and then he proves the following with rational arguments. God exists. God does not have a body. God is not located, spatial or subject to temporality, in other words, to time. God has the attributes of power, knowledge, will, life, speech, hearing and sight. God is one. God wills all things and acts without purpose, and Muhammad was a prophet. With Muhammad's truthfulness as a prophet established by reason, the revelation in the Quran and the prophet Sunnah may be trusted to supply further information about God, the afterlife, the nature of belief and the leadership of the Muslim community. However, revelation may not contradict reason, explains Al-Razi, because it is only reason that we, only by reason, that we know the messenger to be truthful in the first place. Reason must remain the arbiter of truth, even when a trusted messenger informs us of something that opposes reason. The transmitted verbal reports of revelation cannot convey certain knowledge on their own. It's a very interesting point here. Now, Al-Razi thinks within a broad Hellenistic tradition of reason that rules out a corporeal God. Now, Hellenistic tradition refers to Greek philosophy, basically, going all the way back to Plato and Aristotle and, and since then. So Al-Razi is thinking within this Greek tradition, broadly speaking, and that gives him the sense that rules out any idea of a corporeal God, God in have a body. The expression, the all-merciful sat over the throne, and that's a quote, by the way, from the Quran, the all-merciful sat over the throne, cannot be taken in its literal sense, says Arazi, because ascribing spatial extension, body and motion to God is irrational. God is an existent, that cannot be perceived by the human senses. God may not be said to be within the world, nor may he be said to be distinct from it. This leads Al-Razi to prescribe a rule of interpretation that in his book Compendium reads, quote, either knowledge of the literal sense of the text is delegated to God, according to the doctrine of the Salaf, that's the first three generations or so of the companions of the Prophet, or the literal sense is reinterpreted perspicuously according to the doctrine of the Kalam theologians, end quote. 
The term delegate here means to entrust the meaning of the text to God and to stop thinking about its implications in human language. So you just you give it to God. God knows what this means. We accept the, the language. We don't know. It's beyond our understanding. To reinterpret Tawil means to divert the text from its literal meaning to something other meaning, some other meaning deemed appropriate for God. In other words, Arazi posits two steps for interpreting the literal senses of texts, implying corporality in God, implying that God has a body in some sense. So what does Arazi do? The first, either, is to deny that God has a body in accord with what reason requires. Reason here is the thinking, the intellect of a, of a, of a man. So the first is to deny that God has a body in accordance with what reason requires. The second step is to choose between two further options. The way of the Salaf, the earliest Muslims, is to cease interpretation and delegate the meaning to God. In other words, God knows what this really means. The way of most Kalam theologians, however, is to reinterpret the literal sense of the text non-literally. So it doesn't mean what it appears to say it means. In his book, Establishing Sanctification, a thorough refutation of the Hanbalis and others, Arazi himself adopts the latter course, so he prefers the Kalam theologian's method. He reinterprets God's sitting, istiwa in Arabic, as God's vanquishing and possessing. So he sees it as a metaphorical figure of speech. It doesn't actually mean God sitting in some way. He says what it really means, metaphorically, is vanquishing or possessing. That's what the term really means. Ibn Taymiyyah, however, and this is where Ibn Taymiyyah comes in. Ibn Taymiyyah criticises Al-Razi's Al rule of interpretation for stripping God of his attributes and making the Salaf, the first generations of Muslims, out to be ignorant of the foundations of the religion. Wow. So he comes straight in and says, nope, not having that, Razi. Reinterpreting God's sitting as possessing strips God of his attribute of sitting. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. Attributing delegation to the Salaf deprives them of knowledge of the meaning of God's attributes. The Salaf did not simply transmit words only, that is, the verbal forms of God's attributes, and then leave their meaning to God. The Salaf knew and transmitted the meanings as well. Ibn Taymiyyah's contemporary Ashari opponents took this criticism to heart and countered that delegation of meaning was not universal among the Salaf, some of the Salaf had act, had in fact engaged in reinterpretation. Wow. More fundamentally, Ibn Taymiyyah rejects the theological incorporealism that stands behind Al-Razi's rule. So Al-Razi rejects any idea that God can be spoken of in, bodily, in a bodily way at all. Ibn Taymiyyah rejects that. Ibn Taymiyyah does not affirm explicitly that God is bodily, and spatial because the terms body, jism, and spatial extension do not appear in the Quran or the sayings of the Prophet or the Salaf. He seeks to evade the charge of corporealism, i.e. God having a body, him teaching that in some way, by, revert, by reserving the label corporealist, corporealist for those who affirm explicitly that God has a body. Nevertheless, he also does not deny God is, or, is corporeal or spatial. So he doesn't appear to defer, affirm it explicitly or deny it explicitly. Ibn Tamir is decidedly empiricist, writes John Hoover. He claims that nothing incorporeal and non-spatial exists outside the mind. Something existing outside the mind must be accessible to the human senses, and God is no exception. While God cannot be seen in this world, he can be seen in dreams and he will be seen in the hereafter. Ibn Taymiyyah's view of God 
raises questions about God's location and spatial extent, to which I will return below. Right, so writes John Hoover. Now I'm going to skip over several pages here and come to the next section I want to look at, which is entitled, God is sitting over the throne. This is a, uh, an English quote from the Quran. So what does this mean? This is a huge subject of debate uh, in the medieval time, and you still hear it discussed today. I've heard it discussed, even at Speaker's Corner. So God is sitting over the throne. What on earth does this mean? And what does Ibn Taymiyyah say about it? But it's very interesting stuff. So on page 115, John Hoover continues. Ibn Taymiyyah's treatment of God's sitting over the throne in his 1298 work, Hamawiya, and later texts, amply illustrates the interpretive and apologetic aspects of his theology. He maintains that the throne was created before the heavens and earth as we know them. God sitting over the throne must be affirmed in its plain sense, but in a way uniquely befitting God and without inquiring into modality. So what does that mean? Well, you've got to say when God is said to be sitting over the throne, yes, you've got to state that that is true, but in a unique way that is befitting God, without inquiring into modality, without asking, well, how? How is this possible? What does this mean? That we draw the line, we don't go beyond that. Presumably because it's beyond our comprehension. We're dealing with God who is unlike us, according to the Quran. Sitting may not be reinterpreted as possessing. So this is Ibn Taymiyyah's view. So he rejects the Kalam theologian's argument. This is all metaphor. No, you can't reinterpret it in that way. Beyond that, Ibn Taymiyyah is not very interested in exploring whether God touches the throne and such like. But he does have to confront an apparently contradictory Quranic claim, writes John Hoover. How does God's sitting over the throne fit with the Quranic affirmation that God, quote, is with you wherever you are? That's the 57th surah, verse 4. Kalam theologians like Al-Razi said that God cannot be both literally over the throne and literally with us in the world wherever we are. God sitting over the throne cannot be interpreted literally, says Al-Razi and the Kalam theologians. Ibn Taymiyyah disagrees. His interpretation involves three steps. So this is how Ibn Taymiyyah interprets this verse in distinction from the Kalam theologians. Firstly, Ibn Taymiyyah rejects literalism as a theory of meaning. Now, this is interesting because you would never get this general idea from listening to the polemic that goes on about Ibn Taymiyyah in the world today. According to John Hoover, Ibn Taymiyyah rejects literalism as a theory of meaning. It is technically incorrect to call Ibn Taymiyyah a literalist, as is often done. OK, so this is where John Hoover brings his expertise to bear. In the literalist theory of meaning, in the literalist theory of meaning predominant in medieval Islam, each word possesses a literal sense that attaches to it when devoid of context. Then it takes on additional senses when contextual factors divert the literal meaning to non-literal meanings. So the literal sense of lion, for example, is a large and ferocious cat. Calling a fearless man in battle a lion is to divert the term to a non-literal sense. Ibn Taymiyyah articulates instead a pragmatic or contextual theory of meaning. Words do not have literal meanings. Their meanings depend entirely on context. See, this refutes the idea that Ibn Taymiyyah is a literalist, which you hear all the time. Words, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, do not have literal meanings. Their meanings depend entirely on the context. A word stripped of context has no meaning. Someone hearing the word lion always requires contextual indicators to tell whether a large cat or a fearless man is meant. So it's a really important point there. Ibn Taymiyyah is not illiterate. So this is point number one in how to deal with this 
uh, statement, God is sitting over the throne. How is that to be understood according to Ibn Taymiyyah? Secondly, Ibn Taymiyyah establishes the context of God sitting over the throne. As noted earlier, he does not explicitly affirm that God is a body or spatially extended because, and this is important, such terms do not appear in the Quran, the Sunnah and the sayings of the Salaf. That's why. However, he does state that it is known with certainty by revelation, reason and the human natural constitution, presumably the fitra, that God is located above and over all things. Above and be, uh, over all things. He supports this with many Quranic texts, such as they fear the Lord above them. That's 1650. Or the all merciful sat over the throne. Quran 25. And the angels and the spirit ascend to him. Ascend. So a sense of going up. Surah 70, verse 4, as well as Hadith reports like, God is over his throne and he knows what you are doing. Ibn Taymiyyah argues that such texts are so numerous that they provide certain knowledge that God is above and outside the created world. Moreover, Ibn Taymiyyah argues rationally, if God were in the world, he would come into contact with all manner of dirt and filth found in it, within it. That would be unworthy of God. Third point, this is how the third point, how Ibn Taymiyyah uh, comes to understand God is sitting over the throne. Having established this context, Ibn Taymiyyah explains that the plain sense of God's withness in the verse, God is with you wherever you are, is clearly not spatial proximity. It's not spatial. So God is not physically, bodily, physically with us. We already know that God is not in the world, but over and above it. So the plain sense of with is then God's knowledge of our circumstances. So God is with us by his knowledge. So this is how Ibn Timir understands. So this is not literalist, is it? This is much more nuanced, taking into effect a range of teachings and verses in the Quran. So the plain sense of with, God is with you wherever you are, is then God's knowledge of our circumstances, writes John Hoover. Reading withness as God's knowledge is not a matter of reinterpreting with non-literally, as Kalam theologians would have it. It is instead the plain sense of withness dictated by the context in which it is expressed. Isn't that interesting? So he's still not following the Kalam theologians. It's the context that gives us the meaning of the word with or the withness in that context. Ibn Taymiyyah suggests that this is perhaps as when a man speaks of the moon and the stars being with him while travelling by night. Or when a father sitting on a roof tells his crying son on the ground below not to be afraid because he is with him. Ibn Taymiyyah is careful to indicate that his explanation or exploration rather of meaning is not a matter of likening or assimilating God to creatures. The modality remains unknown. So how is it that God is present with us? with his knowledge or by his knowledge. The modality, the means, the way, the mode, remains unknown, according to Ibn Taymiyyah. It is rather a matter of speaking about God in the most praiseworthy fashion, in accord with the Quranic dictum, to God is the highest similitude. Chapter 16, verse 60. To God is the highest similitude. Then we go back to Fakir al-Din al-Razi in his book, Establishing Sanctification. Al-Razi mocks the idea that God is above and over the world. Wow. Al-Razi, who is the great, great Asherite theologian, he mocks this idea that God is above and over the world. He argues that God is incorporeal. In other words, he hasn't got a body at all in any sense. Non-spatial, inaccessible to human senses. 
and neither inside the world nor distinct from it. As noted in chapter two of this book, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote explication of the deceit of the Jahimiya during his first imprisonment in Egypt to refute al-Razi's book. Ibn Taymiyyah's response to two of al-Razi's many arguments will illustrate his rational defence. They also exemplify how Ibn Taymiyyah engages the technical terminology of Kalam theology. In the first argument, al-Razi claims that God cannot be located above every part of the earth. Why? The earth is spherical. It's round, in other words. If God happened to be located above those people living on the eastern part of the earth, God would be below those living on the western part. This being absurd, God cannot be located. Ibn Tamir counters this by saying that people say that God is above the sky no matter where they stand on the spherical earth. People living on the eastern part of the earth do not say that God is below those living on the western part. The direction below does not apply. In a different treatise, Ibn Taymiyyah indicates that God's throne and the heavens below it are exceedingly small in relation to God, I mean relative to God. To emphasise the point, he quotes the Quranic verse, the whole earth will be in his grip on the day of resurrection and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. That's Surah 39, 67. Ibn Taymiyyah explains that the whole of the world is in the hand, explains that the whole world in the hand of God is smaller than a chickpea in one of our hands. With such an image in mind, it is not difficult to imagine God located above a spherical earth from any point on its surface because God completely surrounds it. In a second argument, Arazi asserts that a corporeal God, a bodily God, accessible to the human senses, would have to be the size of the tiniest particle, an atom, I suppose. Anything bigger would be divisible into composite parts. In other words, it could be, you could say this part, that part, and the other part has different parts to it. And God doesn't have parts. A God made of parts would violate God's unity. Therefore, God is obviously neither corporeal nor spatial. Ibn Taymiyyah denies that a charge that a large God would be divisible in separate parts. Something can be both indivisible and large. If God is a spatially extended extant located above his throne, this does not mean that God can be divided up into parts located in distinct spaces. Moreover, Ibn Taymiyyah explains, even the Asharis, including Al-Razi, allow for a measure of distinction and differentiation within God by affirming multiple attributes. If a diversity of real attributes within the essence of God does not render God divisible, in other words, he could be chopped up into smaller parts, then spatial extension in God does not render God divisible either. Ibn Tamir is profoundly reticent, in other words, he's very reluctant to say and speak of God having a body and having spatial extension. The terms are not Quranic. Ibn Taymiyyah cites with approval Averroes' observation that the texts of Revelation are silent as to whether God has a body. Yet, when Ibn Taymiyyah does use the technical terms of Kalam theology to engage al-Razi, he affirms that God is a very large being who completely surrounds the universe. This fits with the Quranic image of God holding the heavens and the earth in his hand. And in the final paragraph I'm going to read from this book, John Hoover says, Ashari and Shi'i polemicists through the centuries have condemned Ibn Taymiyyah for corporealism. And they're still doing it today. I've heard this many times. The charge of corporealism also landed him in prison in Cairo in 1306. 
It was taken that seriously, he was actually imprisoned. While it is well nigh impossible to find Ibn Taymiyyah affirming that God has a body explicitly, there is substantive basis for the charge. Later figures like the Sufi Ibrahim al qurani who died in 1690, have tried to defend Ibn Taymiyyah by assimilating his view to the delegation position attributing to the Salaf in al-Razi's rule. However, Ibn Taymiyyah does not deny the corporality of God outright as al-Razi's rule, rule requires. Instead, he posits a God of enormous size who encompasses the universe. As we shall see next, this God is also ever creative and ever active in a temporal sense. Now I'm going to end the quote there. It's 25 minutes, more than long enough. I do recommend this book. I think that one of the reasons I'm sharing this book is to bring in this nuance uh, that John Hoover brings to bear from an expert point. He's one of the world's leading authorities. Everyone acknowledges this on Ibn Taymiyyah. And uh, some of the crudities that are attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah are, it would seem, false. doesn't mean we have to agree with Ibn Taymiyyah, but at least let us understand what he really taught. Let us bring in that nuance. Let us bring in those shades of meaning rather than the binary black and whites that we usually hear in polemics against Ibn Taymiyyah. Because I think Ibn Taymiyyah, agree with him or not, was a, a genius of great stature, a theologian of great sophistication and nuance. And that's why he's still hugely popular today and worth listening to. Until next time.